Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, you're all very, very welcome to what is one of the highlights of our annual calendar, the, the presidential address. Um, a particular word of welcome, obviously, to everybody here, and also to those who are joining us this evening by webcast. Now, just for everybody here to be aware of the two exit safety exits, and I'm sure at this stage everybody's phone is either on silent or turned off. Um, as I said, this evening is, is really one of the highlights of our annual calendar and, and um, a very particular award of welcome this evening to our president's husband, Jim, and their, their two children, uh, Maeve and Owen. We're delighted to have you here and thank you very, very much for coming along. In, in a few moments, we, we, we'll hear the presidential address, but, but first a little bit about our president. Um, Regina is from Clanmel, and uh, she started her career as a very, very young student in Waterford IT in 1980, where she did a certificate in electronic engineering, graduating with a distinction. That was followed up by a diploma in electronic engineering in Cork IT, and yes, she finished that one with a distinction. Um, her, her formal education continued in the Harriet Watt University uh, in Scotland in organisational behaviour and finance. And again, you guessed it, finished with a distinction. Regina is currently the CEO of Fujitsu in Ireland and she leads a 350 strong team focused on delivering ICT services that add business value to the Irish marketplace. She's a former chair of ICT Ireland within IBEC and is now a member of the board. She's a member of Dublin City University Governing Authority, a Fellow of Engineers Ireland, and a non-executive director of Airgrid. Regina holds an MBA from Dublin City University, which she achieved with first-class honours, coming first in her group. She was also awarded the Sir Charles Harvey Award for Outstanding Contribution in her postgraduate studies, and was recently awarded the IT Person of the Year Award at the 2014 Tech Excellence Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our 2014-15 President, Regina Morn. That's when you're hoping the technology works. Konbanwa, Yokoso. Good evening and welcome. In our company, Fujitsu, we sometimes use Japanese proverbs, and they're amazingly like the ones found in the Irish language. Aino Nakano Kawaz, Taikai O Shiraz. And that means very simply, a frog in a pond cannot see the great ocean. Much like the proverb, as engineers, we see beyond the boundaries to what is possible. As technologists, we are constantly pushing the boundaries to create new possibilities. The opportunities for our profession in this new world are immense. Past presidents, vice presidents, director general, council members, guests, fellow engineers, and of course my family, Jim, my husband up there, and two of my three children, Maeve and Owen, you are all very welcome. What an honour it is to be here this evening to give my presidential address. Walking up the steps of Clyde Road this evening. I thought back to my very first job as an electronics technician in Cork. And I must say I felt a mixture of pride and a certain amount of disbelief. As Paul O'Connell would say, unreal. 
I have chosen two main themes of this presidential year. Convergence between all forms of engineering and the challenge of attracting women to our profession. I want Engineers Ireland to thrive and push the boundaries of our new interconnected world and it is my ambition to try to help make this happen. I would like to start though by first giving you an insight into my world, the company I work with Fujitsu and the ICT sector where I have spent all of my career. It's hard to believe that this is a picture of Tokyo back in the 1920s. You can see the tram lines, they had their own Lewis. And telecommunications infrastructure, road networks, and so forth. A kind of a modern day image almost of engineering at its best. However, in 1923, the great Kanto earthquake, measuring 7.9 on the Richter scale, struck. It destroyed much of Tokyo and Yokohama's public infrastructure. The transport, water, telecommunications were wiped out in either the quake or the ensuing firestorms. 120,000 people were killed. In response, a small group of engineers set out and went to Germany to learn about the new automatic switching equipment which could help rebuild their country, Japan. Collaborating with their German colleagues, they founded a company, a joint venture between Furukawa Electric and Siemens of Germany, which they called Fuji Electric. <coughs> From these humble beginnings, Fujitsu has grown into a global corporation. The organization where I work today has 162,000 Fujitsu people supporting customers in more than 100 countries. Fujitsu has a vision of a human intelligent society, a human centric intelligent society with engineering at its core. Fujitsu's heritage as an engineering company, which is focused on solving some of today's most challenging problems, continues right through to the present day. In an interesting parallel, during the recent crisis at the Fukushima nuclear plant, which was caused, you might remember, by an earthquake followed by a tsunami, engineers were called on yet again. Our Fujitsu president, Yamamoto, made all of our engineers available around the clock to repair data centers, to get telecommunications back online, to use engineering skills wherever possible. Engineering solves the most difficult human problems. Of this, there is no doubt. Tokyo, with now almost 30 million people, was largely unaffected by a 9.0 earthquake. Engineers, in less than 100 years, built a city capable of withstanding a much bigger quake. But nature, in the form of a 100-foot tsunami, still caused havoc. Another challenge to be solved by engineers, but I guess that's for another day. As your president, I'm excited and confident about the future year ahead, but I also realise the challenges we face in Engineers Ireland. As you know, we are undertaking a strategic review. The challenge for us as a member-based organisation is to remain both relevant and in tune with our current and potential members. My presidency would be one of convergence, convergence of technology and all forms of engineering. It would be a presidency that celebrates all of our possibilities and our diversities. One that continues to push boundaries and be of assistance and encouragement to those in schools and colleges who might consider engineering and to companies who must encourage job creation in our profession. It is true that there's huge convergence happening between all forms of engineering and technology. Not only is there a convergence of technology, but also of all of our engineering disciplines. 
you cannot design and build the Samuel Beckett Bridge without technology. And you certainly can't design a smartphone application without engineering. This is also creating an opportunity for Engineers Ireland in the 21st century to expand our reach, increase our membership, and provide a structured framework in which convergence is managed and controlled across multiple engineering disciplines, working in teams to solve multifaceted problems. It's worth looking, I think, at some facts about the ICT sector in Ireland. We directly employ 105,000 people, with 75% employed in multinational companies and the remainder in the indigenous technology sector. In the last three years, over 17,500 jobs have been announced by technology companies. The sector is responsible for 40% of our national exports and is home to eight of the top 10 global technology companies. Certainly Ireland is emerging as a global technology hub. But from the President of Engineers Ireland perspective, this shows the size of the opportunity for Engineers Ireland's membership, and it is one that is largely untapped. It is not beyond the bounds of possibility to double our membership if the value proposition is right. There is a collision happening between the physical world and the digital world, which is creating opportunities for all of us in the engineering sectors. As we see in this slide here, we all live in the physical <coughs> world, which increasingly we are sensing using IT, even wearable IT. This is generating large amounts of data, which then creates knowledge. This knowledge is about our physical environment. It allows us to better navigate and make changes to improve our physical world. In the past two decades, the combination of computing, connectivity, and the internet has grown the world's digital economy from zero to tens of trillions of euro. A new generation of the internet is emerging. People and the things around us are all linked together, sharing information. The World Economic Forum calls it the hyper-connected world, and it has huge impacts for the future. More connectivity means more collaboration. It means vanishing boundaries. It means changes to the way businesses work and how society creates value. But it also means risk and uncertainty. It means the future will be very different from the past. There is enormous change happening. The hyper-connected world was made possible when the internet was born, and all manner of things became accessible to almost everyone, anywhere. The internet has brought together everybody and everything, people, companies, governments, and most recently machines. The hyper-connected world is the foundation of modern communication, trade, human, scientific and economic development. It is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And it encompasses almost everything and everybody within its borders. The economic, political, social and business consequences of this new landless continent are real and of a far greater magnitude than anyone could have imagined and we are only at the very beginning of its exploration. It is the playground now for all our businesses and our organizations and how many of us increasingly live. At the heart of the hyper-connected world is a new industrial revolution. We in Engineers Ireland, I think, need to be very aware of these implications. This revolution is happening now as we connect all things to the internet and all things to each other. We don't live in a world of screens and computers. We live in the physical world. We sleep in beds, we eat food, we drive cars, we work in buildings, we socialize in cities. But this physical world is being transformed. 
You may have heard of the Internet of Things. The digital world will connect your car, your washing machine, air conditioners, even your light bulbs. In 2013, around 10 billion devices are online and connected to the Internet. But this number is likely to increase to 50 billion or more by 2020. And as the number of endpoints increase, so does the amount of information. Harnessing this information gives us new insight and greater control of our world. It creates knowledge, but it also carries risk. With so much of what we do in the physical world now written down in bits in our digital world, we face a serious challenge to secure what we do and protect our privacy. We must also defend ourselves against ever-increasing malicious threats. <coughs> we must avoid the chaos the change always has the potential to bring. A huge challenge where engineers can make critical interventions. All of these technology trends will have an impact on engineering and how we all come together to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. Engineering matters. And Engineers Ireland is the voice of engineering on this island. Across the globe, there are Irish engineers, our diaspora. We have almost a unique position of representing nearly 18,000 engineers from multiple disciplines all over this island and beyond. I've been able to harness the power of convergence of engineering underpinned by technology. Living in the hyper-connected world means we are vulnerable <coughs> to the same risks and we all share the same challenges. The world's population has just passed the 7 billion mark and continues to grow and change. We are ageing and we are moving into cities, creating new challenges for our social infrastructure. We are facing the threat of climate change, as evidenced by the conference just this week in New York. We must provide food <coughs> for a growing population and improve food yields. We, as in Japan, must respond to natural disasters. <coughs> So how do we respond to the challenge of this hyper-connected world? How do we take advantage of the opportunity? How do we guard against the many risks? These changes have huge implications for enterprises and organizations, bring challenges of resource management, challenges <coughs> of healthcare, disaster mitigation, and our environment. Put simply, we need more engineers in the world. There is both a global and local challenge to attract and retain talent in our profession. So where are we going to get these engineers? I would say this, wouldn't I? Women still remain largely an untapped resource in our profession. We must find ways of attracting young girls as well as young boys to join forces with us and tackle some of these great global issues. As part of my term, I will champion the schools, colleges and companies who are encouraging women to join the engineering world at any level. This lady here started it all. It's Alice Perry, the first woman engineering graduate in Ireland or Britain back in 1906. She paved the way for other women to study engineering <coughs> I strongly believe we need more women engineers and, if I might be so bold, I think we need more women in this organisation at every level too. Earlier this year, Silicon Republic, which is the online technology media company, set out to compile a list of the leading women in the areas of science, technology, engineering and maths in Ireland. From world-leading academics to inspiring science communicators, from tech business leaders to early stage entrepreneurs and lots of engineers, they were spoiled for choice. And they ended up with a leading 100 list. And the good news is the number is still growing. However, in last year's engineering's perspective report, 
we were told that on average the ratio of men to women in engineering was nine to one. Nine to one. But the good news is that a fifth of all the respondents in the survey were women, and half of these were under the age of 35. I think this is a very positive signal that more women are actually choosing a career in engineering, as they recognise the vast variety of opportunities available to them in areas such as technology, civil, energy, life sciences. I think there are 70 different forms of engineering at least huge opportunities. It is very heartening for us in Engineers Ireland to see that programmes like our STEPS Schools Outreach Programme is producing results. Our STEPS campaign, touching the lives and ambitions of more than 56,000 young people last year, is a testament to the dedication of Engineers Ireland volunteers across this island. Other professions, like law and medicine, do not have the skills to tackle some of the great global challenges. Some of the ones we mentioned, like climate change, like population growth, or indeed specific challenges mentioned by past presidents, Michael Phillips, when he talked about the challenge of urbanization, and John O'Dea, who talked about the challenge of medical engineering. We should also celebrate, as Michael D. Higgins, our other president, just joke. <laughs> <laughs> mentioned in a recent speech, he said that he was proud of our engineering companies in Ireland, that we in those companies are meeting needs across the world, from software systems in place at 10 Downing Street to the customer information centre on the Paris Metro, to medical devices that enable blood-free surgery in cardiac centres around the world. We have groundbreaking initiatives happening right now in Ireland. Our engineers are making a real difference. And I think we have to continue to maximise the convergence of technology and engineering. The path to the CEO office should not be through the CFOs, no disrespect to any finance people in the room, and it should not be through the marketing department. Sorry, Tom and Kelly. It needs to be through engineering and design. And they're the words of Elon Musk, the founder of PayPal and Tesla Motors. And I completely agree with him. It is a great honour to hold the office of President of Engineers Ireland. And I accept and appreciate the great responsibilities and prestige of this office. By my calculations, but I might be wrong, I'm around about the 178th president and the third woman in this position. I must acknowledge the immense contribution made to those of you here that previously served as president, and particularly the two great women who preceded me, Jane Grimson, who I see here, and Anne Butler. Your contributions have inspired me and many other women. Thank you to all Engineers Ireland members and staff who make such a difference. Thousands of volunteer hours at regions and divisions, at steps outreach, at events, on interview panels, at council and executive, supported by dedicated staff here in the House. This is a wonderful organisation, led with passion by John Power. Thanks to all of you for your warmth and friendship. You have helped enormously so far in the task of increasing membership and putting Engineers Ireland firmly on the map as relevant and important for the times in which we live and work. And I will continue to do my absolute best to support this work. I am proud to be an engineer. I am proud to be a technologist. I'm delighted to be a female running a global company in Ireland, but I am immensely proud to serve you as your president. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. I'm open 
the, the floor to questions, <laughs> which is always dangerous. Um, <coughs> Um, or for Japanese, we just say... Uh, Are we so conducting the rest of it in Japanese? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> just a couple, of positive, a couple of positive points in terms of um, uh, John McKernan, from external, head of external collaboration at ESB. Uh, we sponsored the Spark of uh, Genius Award at the Web Summit, which will be hosted next door very shortly. Um, last year, the winner of the Spark of Genius Award was the CEO was a woman, Grania Barron, and her company's doing really well. Video, they make video clips for websites, so fantastic. And this year, they've done something different. They've shortlisted three companies out of the 30, which were shortlisted from a longer list. Um, and two of the three presenters on the evening were ladies. So it's good to know that actually they are arriving fast and furious and very strong. So some words of encouragement maybe there. Great, thank you very much. That's not a question, that's even better. <laughs> Sorry, Raymond Sexton. Look, it's my hobby horse, which is obviously the, the issue of ratio of one to nine women to men is a big issue, but I think the challenge I continually come against in, in Ireland is the, the ratio of engineers in government, in the sense that it, we've highlighted here yet again the key role, the key approaches, the disciplines, the, 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 the professionalism. And yet, as a profession, we leave the top uh, challenge in the country to the publicans, the school teachers, and the solicitors. So my challenge, a question to yourself is, will we not take that on as well and have more women in there as well as more women in engineering? Well, I have no desire to go into politics now, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that's where some of the policy makers are obviously is in government and, and uh, the politicians, but I think myself that um, we have to actually address engineering and how it is described to young people and their parents. That's where I think the biggest, because it's a complex thing to describe. Um, my own view was we don't have a good old soap opera either like they have for some of the other professions, but I think it's very difficult for people to visualize what it means to be an engineer because it's so diverse. But I think if we could influence myself, that you know, I think it's a grassroots thing, and I think if you can influence um, children and their parents, and we we swell the numbers actually choosing at the start, then I think the whole thing will filter up even through the political system. Uh, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Define an engineer. Is a coder an engineer? Is somebody who knows Java, HTML, all those disciplines, are they an engineer? I think, it, to, to my mind, an engineer is somebody that can solve a problem in a structured way. And that's, I mean, you know, I, I just, John mentioned my past. I mean, I came uh, through the <coughs> electronics technician route myself. Um, and I think good engineers, and that's the quote, why I like the quote from Elon Musk is, they're problem solvers, and and that can be from from a multiple disciplines. And I think when when engineering started out back in the days of Alice Perry, it was quite a narrow thing, and and there was you know it was, there was maybe one or two disciplines, but there's a multitude. And I suppose what I'm seeing more and more is problems are solved by teams of people, not individuals. And the more multifaceted the team is, the better the chances of solving problems. So certainly in my organisation. Uh, we have people in the applications world, people in the infrastructure world, people on the service side, and they all come together now to solve problems. The question, to be a member of Engineers Ireland, do you have to have, say, a predefined qualification, for instance? Do you have to be in the mechanical, electrical, et cetera, et cetera, or have a... <laughs> well, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Okay. But I do think the point I was making about the technology <coughs> sector is um, and people in the computing division, I think, support this because I've met them. Is there's probably a whole raft of of new career types that weren't imagined five years ago that we need to, you know, think about in our strategic review and think about how can we make ourselves relevant to that cohort of people. I mean, nobody heard of uh, an iPhone app developer five years ago. So the pace of change is rapid, and as an organisation, engineers aren't have to remain relevant both to our current membership and stay in tune with our current membership, but also see how can we embrace the rapidly changing environment in which we operate. 
Um, thank you very much for um, a, a very interesting address, and thank you also for uh, taking questions. Um, you spoke about uh, convergence at the start, and then you mentioned towards the end that there's 70 or maybe more different engineering disciplines. Um, and you, and you talk about um, the, the kind of generic qualities that define an engineer. Uh, have you any thoughts on how uh, higher education should be responding in, in terms of, of training engineers for the future, rather than in these maybe 70 different silos? Well, if I speak about that from a personal perspective, and this is a personal view, not necessarily as present, I think there has been too much specialization myself and we've branched into maybe, to at, at a base qualification level, too many different things. And the day you start and the day you finish, you can never be up to speed with the day you start work, you know, because the pace of change is so rapid. My own personal view is that we probably need a, a more common base engineering qualification, which is all around problem solving, leadership, and teamwork. <coughs> because when you go into the work environment, they're the things that matter, and less specialization, because to stay relevant, particularly in our sector, the technology sector, from the day you go in to four years later is very difficult, and I think it's a challenge. So I would, my own view is maybe we've gone you know, too much into all the different fields, and by the time you come out, will that still be the relevant thing, particularly in the technology domain? But that's a personal view. President P.J. Rutten of RPS. Uh, building on what you've just said, I was going to ask you, even before you said it, um, you know, your address, um, for which I thank you, uh, was markedly different to any other presidential address which I've heard here. Is that and, and it's good, very good. Uh, where are you going with this? Where I'm coming from. Uh, your, your connections that you're making between the engineering world and uh, the human world. I think what I detect from your presentation is that you put a lot of store on, on human engineering and the impact on, on individuals, be it climate change or be it congestion or be it um, uh, you know, uh, natural disasters and so on. Um, can the ICT world help in any way in you know, um, attracting uh, young people, boys and girls, and indeed, especially girls, for they're lacking at the moment. It's the personality of engineering, uh, and it is the personality of engineering, be it problem solving, be it creativity, be it a wish to communicate uh, the technical things and the things that the internet better, that uh, sends a lot of engineers indeed into the business world and into the commercial world and even into the legal world. Is there, a, is there something we can build on here in terms of? personality and the psychology of engineering that will help us, first of all, get a higher public profile, because I don't think we are recognized for what we do, despite what we think we do. We think we, we, think we control the world, and, and from turning on the light in the morning to uh, switching it off at night. But you know, the, the, I'm afraid the, the, the world at, at large doesn't share that, that vision of engineering, and to promote engineering, and also to promote it as a career, uh, that is not just relevant to making these technical things happen, but making the world a better place in terms of, you know, uh, famine relief and so on and so forth. Thank you. Well, I just, I suppose in Ireland, I can only really comment about Ireland, but I have some experience in the, in the UK as well. What I think has been good over the last number of years, and maybe it's needs must, is an awful lot of organisations, for example, like ICT Ireland within IBEC, Engineers Ireland, have come together on, under a smart futures umbrella. And the message we're trying to get is, in any of the STEM areas, there, there's lots of opportunities. So rather than us each go, if you like, and try and attract different cohorts of people and compete against each other, there's one overarching umbrella. And there's also one policy-making entity that are kind of covering all the different strands, which I think is a big step forward, Peter, because the message has to be very crisp and concise. Um, I was over, in, not dropping names now, but I will anyway, in, in, in number 10 Downing Street. <laughs> had to say that. Um, no, but they're, they're, they're launching a campaign in, in the UK which just touches on your very point, and they're calling it Your Life. 
and they're putting an awful lot of um, resources behind it from across all the sectors, everyone in this room sector, if you like. And the idea is to just get in tune with young people because they have a huge, we think we've got an issue, they have a huge issue in the UK with attracting people to STEM. I think they said something like, was it 2% of physics A levels for girls or something? Some really small number, which I was a bit shocked at. So it's not a challenge that we just have. But the good thing about Ireland is you can get groups of people around a table very quickly here, disparate groups, and get something going. And I've seen that happen. And I think that is beginning to have an impact, a positive impact on just exactly what you say, explaining in a simple term something that's quite complex to people, to reach out to people and make them excited about the prospect of being involved in this world. And we might kind of keep an eye on what they're doing in the UK. Plagiarism is probably good as well, if, if, if it's working out. But they're going to have like a film, they're going to have ad campaigns, going to have social media, a viral campaign, all of those things. Any more questions? One at the back there. Mort. President, thank you for an excellent and most interest, interesting presentation. You talked about the hyper-connected world and, and the, the internet bringing all components together and it, it being the playground for, for business and just the beginning and a new revolution and uh, so forth. And you talked about all the positives, but on two occasions you mentioned risks that you were concerned about. Could you develop those a bit, please? Well, I mean, if every, like, it's very simple, really, and it's, it's in the area, I suppose, of, of hacking. You know, if you have everything connected and all of our physical world is represented in bits and bytes in the digital world, how do you protect that? How do you protect that from what I call malicious threats? That's, that's a, a real concern. And you have to engineer security into solutions. There's no point in trying to retrofit, because then it's happened. So that, it's a bit like designing for testability. You probably know that phrase. If you, don't, if you design it in, then you can test it out. It's very hard to do that retrospectively. So it's the same thing with being aware right from the get-go. And I think people are, but there's, there's four uh, g around tables right now talking about the issue of, of data security from a privacy point of view, but also from a threat point of view. Because what you could <coughs> do with that information, data, and knowledge can be very positive. I mean, you can control the traffic with them. Michael, you told with a wave of your hand, you can get the red lights all turned to green. But you could also do something quite sinister. So it's, it's for all of us involved in this world to be aware. And the solution, again, is to engineer the controls into the world, as opposed to try and retrofit it afterwards. Are we good to go to the bar? <laughs> Okay, I call on Michael um, Higgins to go to the Mr. Chairman, it's my privilege to propose that the engineers, are, the best tanks of engineers Ireland be extended to the President for her address, and on their behalf to request her permission to include her address in the transactions. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. He's, he's dying for a drink at this point. Yeah, yeah. Not at all. Um, I'm just jealous of the president. <laughs> and uh, it is my pleasure uh, to uh, second the vote of thanks uh, for an excellent and most interesting uh, address. And I would ask you to show your appreciation uh, and, and join me uh, in the usual way. Thank you very much.